Hello, my name is D.L. Lundberg. I use she, her, or Z here pronouns. Uh, and I am creating this video to provide an article summary uh, for a publication I co-authored with my collaborator, Dr. Jess Chen, who uses she, her pronouns. Uh, and this publication is in the Lancet Regional Health Americas uh, uh, this month, uh, December 2023. And the article is entitled Structural Ableism in Public Health and Healthcare, a Definition and Conceptual Framework. And just to provide a visual description, uh, the screen contains a slide deck and in the corner is a uh, small video frame uh, where I'm talking and I am a white disabled trans feminine person uh, currently wearing a black and gold turtleneck uh, and I have brown wavy hair. And then on the screen, uh, there is a photo of uh, me presenting this work at the University of Washington School of Public Health, where I'm wearing a gray dress and standing with a walking stick. The purpose of this video is to provide an article summary that I am going to try to keep under uh, 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, I will not be able to get into the entire article, but my goal is to provide uh, and highlight some of the key points. Uh, all content that I share verbally in this presentation will also be shared textually on the slides and vice versa. And other formats of this work and the full article are available uh, links on my website and those links are available in the description of this video uh, and I will also share them at the end of this slideshow. First to provide a little bit of positionality information uh, on the slide is a photo of me followed by Dr. Chen. Uh, I am a disabled neurodivergent trans feminine person. I am a white settler and identify with slash within the queer, crip, and mad community. I am a PhD student at the University of Washington School of Public Health and completing a graduate certificate in disability studies. And I am also uh, affiliated with Boston University School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Chen is a second generation Taiwanese American cisgender woman with lived experience of disability. Uh, she is a clinical psychologist in the pain rehabilitation program at the VA Puget Sound Health System and an assistant professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine. To jump into some background to this article, uh, this article was really motivated by the fact that structural ableism has received limited attention in the public health and health services literature. Uh, and this is notable for several reasons. Uh, first, disabled people represent uh, an estimated 16% of the world's population. Uh, second, interpersonal disability-based discrimination remains prevalent, including in the healthcare system. Uh, and third, large health inequities exist for and among disabled people, which relate at least in part to discrimination, inaccessibility, and barriers in health systems and society. Despite limited engagement from public health and healthcare, Disability studies and disability justice scholars have written extensively about structural barriers that ableism poses for health uh, in a body of scholarship that spans many decades. Uh, and this includes uh, scholarship from uh, researchers, scholars, advocates, and or artists like Mia Mingus, T.L. Lewis, and Patty Byrne, uh, whose pictures are on the slide, uh, along with uh, countless other folks, but uh, a few folks we reference in the article are Subini Anima, Nicole Brown, Carly Friedman, and others. While we began this project uh, in late 2022, uh, it has taken on increased uh, relevance recently. Uh, in spring of 2023, a really foundational and critical article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by researchers Rupa Valdez and Bonnie Lynn Sweenor. And uh, in September of this year, 2023, uh, as shown in the headline pictured on the screen, 
the uh, National Institutes of Health designated people with disabilities as a population with health disparities uh, and accompanied that with calls for research on ableism and structural ableism. So our article had three main aims. We first reviewed uh, some disability studies and disability justice scholarship and research on structural determinants of health in an attempt to synthesize a definition of structural ableism that would be tailored for public health and healthcare care research. Uh, second, we proposed potential pathways by which structural ableism may influence health. And finally, we suggested several principles for studying structural ableism in health systems. Describing the effects of structural ableism on health greatly exceeds the scope of a single publication and is something that is going to require uh, many years of scholarship and really sustained funding and support. And so our broader goal in this piece uh, was really to inspire dialogue about why structural ableism has often been ignored in the public health and health services literature and the ways that these fields have been complicit in perpetuating and legitimizing ableism. Just to give a quick uh, overview as to what the actual contents of the article include, uh, the first section provides a tailored definition. Uh, the next section provides the conceptual framework uh, describing potential pathways between structural ableism and health for further research. Uh, then the final section discusses several principles for studying structural ableism. A huge goal for us with this article was to highlight the critical scholarship that uh, has happened uh, to date that uh, non-disabled scholars are in general not engaging with enough. Uh, so there are 45 uh, references in the main article. And then in addition to the main article, uh, we included an additional 95 references that uh, we weren't able to include in the main text, uh, but in this supplement, we highlight um, prior definitions of ableism and definitions of structural ableism, uh, selected literature on policies related to structural ableism, eugenics, institutionalization, and health, uh, literature related to intersectionality and ableism, and also provide a supplemental text that describes our language choices and a little bit more information about our narrative review approach. So to go into the first section of the article, uh, we describe structural ableism in the following way. Uh, we write that structural ableism is a system of historical and contemporary policies, institutions, and societal norms and practices that devalue and disadvantage people who are disabled, neurodivergent, chronically ill, mad and or living with mental illness and privileged people who are positioned as able-bodied and able-minded. In terms of the impacts of structural ableism, structural ableism denies disabled communities equitable access to social resources and to disability competent and affirming health services, control over whether their experiences are listened to and believed, autonomy over how their needs are represented and responded to, and justice when they are exposed to harm, discrimination, and violence. Structural ableism may influence health and contribute to health inequities for disabled people uh, through multiple pathways uh, that may really differ by community. Structural ableism is upheld via interlocking systems of power and oppression such as racism, sexism, transphobia, capitalism, and colonialism, and operates alongside autism, sanism, and other types of disability-related bias and discrimination, including internalized and interpersonal ableism. Structural ableism may particularly harm disabled people who live at the intersection of multiple systems of oppression, such as those organized around race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation and religiosity, body shape and size, age, migrant status, nationality, and or geographic location. 
given that this is just a short video, I uh, don't have time to kind of highlight uh, all of the different uh, authors we cited uh, in reviewing this uh, prior work and uh, generating this definition, but uh, the article and the supplement uh, hopefully do an effective job of uh, highlighting those folks. Um, and as we share in the article, um, if you cite uh, this article, we think it is very important that you uh, engage with citing uh, disability studies and disability justice uh, scholars. The main contribution of this article is the conceptual framework, uh, which is highlighted in the figure in the screen. This framework uh, is intended to propose potential pathways between structural ableism and health. So in the figure, uh, in the top left box, are the words structural ableism, and those are shown uh, in a bidirectional relationship with other interlocking systems of power and oppression. And then underneath that, there uh, are essentially uh, a series of pathways between structural ableism and the outcome which is health of disabled people and other populations impacted by ableism. We divide the pathways into three groups. Uh, the first group is upstream pathways. So these are kind of the most uh, structural in a sense, in that they reflect policies, uh, sociocultural attitudes and depiction, uh, systems within healthcare decision making and research that exclude disabled people, the reliance on the biomedical model of disability in public health and healthcare, and the legacies of eugenics and institutionalization that permeate and continue to inform uh, healthcare today. Moving a little bit more. Uh, downstream, uh, we propose a second category of more proximate pathways. These include things like disability incompetent and non-affirming healthcare, barriers in education, housing, and employment, uh, physical accessibility, inaccessibility in the environment, along with virtual inaccessibility, uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, assault, harassment, uh, any type of victimization that disabled people experience at higher rates. And then very importantly, uh, carceral and other types of state violence. Uh, in our article, we uh, don't go into depth, but we provide a few examples for each of those pathways um, to kind of illustrate uh, why they uh, may be important areas for future research. Lastly, we describe several potential physiological and behavioral processes that could uh, potentially uh, serve to embody these pathways um, in the human uh, body mind and influence health. These include things like chronic stress and allostatic load, minority stress and health effects of trauma, and health risk behaviors as a coping strategy. All of these pathways are uh, potential areas for future research, and pathways may differ by community of disabled people um, and uh, should also consider the intersection of the oppression, uh, different types of oppression uh, listed at the top because those may influence how things uh, play out in terms of these pathways. So that uh, conceptual framework is definitely not intended to be comprehensive, uh, presenting a complete review of uh, all of uh, the research on uh, disabled health equity to date is a uh, bigger uh, project than what we set out to accomplish. But um, it will be uh, very important that this uh, framework and uh, definition and everything that we've uh, proposed in this article continues to uh, evolve and uh, change as uh, the field advances, particularly uh, now that there is hopefully going to be increased uh, funding and infrastructure to support this portfolio 
uh, of research um, among the, the many disabled researchers uh, who are attempting to advance this field. For that reason, we conclude our article uh, by suggesting uh, several principles for studying structural ableism that we wanted to emphasize. And I will conclude this presentation by just highlighting a few points uh, from uh, each of these principles. So the first uh, principle that we suggest is to interrogate public health and healthcare's role in perpetuating structural ableism. And in this section of our article, we write that before public health and healthcare institutions can effectively contribute to dismantling structural ableism in their fields, it is critical that members of these institutions commit to interrogating the ways that they continue to uphold ableism in their own communities. And uh, this includes listening to the experiences of disabled people within their workforces and responding to their needs and leadership. Uh, second, we uh, suggest resisting the biomedical model of disability as an objective and universal framework. Uh, we get into this in more detail in uh, the article, but the biomedical model of disability uh, understands disability as impairment resulting from a health condition, uh, which is an incredibly limited uh, view of disability that doesn't align with uh, other models, such as the social model um, and any, uh, uh, many other models that exist. And so in the article we write, researchers should resist the biomedical model as the only framework for understanding disability and avoid measures that privilege it. Instead, we encourage use of the social model of disability as a starting point for interrogating the biomedical model and recommend engaging with disability studies and disability justice scholarship to determine the most relevant models for use, which may differ by context and community. The third principle we suggest is to recognize that experiences of disability and health differ across culturally. Uh, we highlight several uh, very critical articles from uh, scholars who discuss uh, the idea that Eurocentric conceptions of disability, uh, chiefly the biomedical model, but uh, also the social and human rights models are often described as universal but imposing such understandings of disability on indigenous and or global health communities can contribute to erasures of indigenous knowledge, ignore strengths that exist, and reinforce colonial patterns. The fourth principle we suggest is to connect structural ableism to structural racism and other forms of oppression. DISCRIT is a framework proposed by researcher Subini Anima that combines concepts from critical race theory and disability studies to analyze race and disability as interdependent constructs using an intersectional framework. Uh, this work is situated within a long tradition of Black feminist and critical race scholarship and activism in which intersectionality has challenged interlocking systems of power. The fifth principle we suggest is to examine upstream pathways upholding ableism along with more proximate ones. Uh, specifically, we write structural ableism should be studied at multiple levels, including the upstream pathways, institutions, and systems upholding ableism as described in our conceptual framework. To support these efforts, it is critical that public health and healthcare institutions name ableism and structural ableism as drivers of health inequities for disabled people and direct appropriate resources. The final principle we suggest uh, is to dismantle academic and institutional forms of ableism and center disabled people. We write that it is critical that researchers studying structural ableism acknowledge their positionality, partner with disabled scholars and community members in ways that meaningfully distribute resources and power, 
read and cite disability studies and disability justice scholarship and work to disseminate research in ways that are accessible to disabled and deaf communities. With that, we offer the following conclusion to our article. We write that while the public health and healthcare fields have often positioned themselves as allies to disabled people, these fields have had a significant and sustained role in perpetuating and legitimizing structural ableism. Because of that, the larger purpose of this viewpoint is to call for increased engagement around ableism as a structural determinant of health to advance more equitable health policies and healthcare practices for disabled people and other populations impacted by ableism. Ultimately, the most promising strategy to interrupt ableism is to center a representative coalition of disabled people in the solutions. That concludes uh, this video in the presentation. Uh, minus a few acknowledgements that I uh, would like to give. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge the Intersectionality Training Institute, founded by Dr. Lisa Boling, uh, for their training and for their intellectual contributions to health equity research that informed our work on this article. Uh, in terms of uh, funding support, uh, I was supported uh, by a T32 uh, fellowship from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Equality. And uh, Dr. Chen was supported by funding from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and to just offer a disclaimer, the content represented uh, in this article and in this video are our own views and do not represent those of our funders uh, or any other affiliations. Uh, this uh, video definitely didn't capture everything uh, in our article, so um, we encourage you to uh, take a chance to uh, access it. Um, it is available online uh, open access, and uh, you can find the article along with uh, other dissemination resources at the following uh, link. Uh, and there is also a QR code on the screen that uh, you are welcome to scan using your phone that will also take you to this link. Uh, but the link is uh, structural-ableism-2023.dllundberg.com and DL Lundberg is spelled D-I-E L L E L U N D B E R G. Uh, and we will put the information uh, for those links in the description of this video uh, as well. And the final thing I wanted to uh, share once again is uh, the uh, supplement. Uh, is available online and it includes um, a uh, expanded reference list um, and tables that highlight additional scholarship that we were not able to include in the main article. Uh, but we really encourage folks to uh, check that out and get a sense of the incredible um, work that, that folks are doing in this space and Hopefully, uh, as ableism and structural ableism gain greater attention and greater support as determinants uh, of health and things that we need to research and intervene on, uh, this body of scholarship will only continue to grow. So thank you for uh, your time and for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I have provided my email on the screen. It is uh, my first name. D-I-E-L-L-E -L -L -E at U-W dot E-D-U. Thank you.